Um, but yeah, we're gonna talk about one of my favorite uh, uh, park units, uh, uh, Cedar Breaks. And uh, before I get going too far, I, I should acknowledge most of the photos uh, in my slide were uh, taken by my, uh, my colleague, Doug Reynolds, uh, uh, or at least the good photos were taken by Doug, uh, but I didn't necessarily attribute those. So uh, sorry about that, Doug, but uh, he, he's a really good photographer as well as a great botanist and a great guy to hang out with. So um, let's see. Because now my screen is freezing up. Oops. There we go. So uh, Cedar Breaks, if, if you haven't been there before, uh, it's this really neat little area on the east side of the Markagunt Plateau, uh, or I'm sorry, the west side of Mar the Markagunt Plateau, uh, east of Cedar City. Uh, up high, uh, uh, you know, it's about 10,000 feet at the, at the top. And uh, it's this big amphitheater, basically, of uh, carved out earth, uh, this giant canyon. Um, it's about five, six miles uh, long, uh, maybe two, two to three miles across, and rapidly eroding and into these really interesting uh, geologic uh, hoodoos and weird uh, formations. And of course, this, this beautiful orange, reddish, and white uh, uh, Clairon formation is quite striking. And, and uh, no accident that this was set aside as a, as a national monument. Um, we're just going to give you a little overview of, of the area and why it's kind of interesting, you know, the geology and the ecology of the area, and then focus on uh, some of the interesting rare plants that occur there. It's a little interesting hotspot of, of diversity that uh, kind of contributes to the great diversity of, of wild plants that we have in the, in the state of Utah. Uh, here's a kind of aerial view, so you can see, um, or maybe you can see it, here's the boundary of Cedar Breaks National Monument, I'm tracing it with my cursor in green. Uh, you can see the, in, they kind of show up in white in this aerial uh, image, but uh, you can see these uh, formations, the Clairon Formation, where it's, it's carved out, you have these big canyons. Um, the, the big chunk of it is, it is within Cedar Breaks National Monument. There's a little bit more to the north and to the south. Uh, this is the... Um, Twisted Forest area, and then the, um, the, uh, also this area by the big golf ball, um, which the name of it just went out of my head. This is part of the Ashdown Gorge Wilderness Area of Dixie National Forest, and then the areas to the, uh, the east are also part of the, the Dixie Forest. Um, the, uh, I've got to really talk about kind of cedar breaks in the, in the broader sense the, uh, to cover the, the whole uh, amphitheater uh, area. Although the, the monument itself is just this uh, smaller portion. And there's another map, shows a little better. Uh, the monument in purple, Ashdown Gorge uh, here outlined in orange. Um, it's interesting, a few years ago, there was a proposal by the, uh, the Urn County uh, commissioners to uh, have the Ashdown Gorge kind of be merged with, with the monument and to create a Cedar Breaks National Park out of it. I'm not sure that gained much traction, but uh, be an interesting idea anyway. Um, the monument was established by President Roosevelt uh, under the Antiquities Act in 1933. It's relatively small as park plans go in, in Utah. It's 6,100 acres. Um, and it's not one of the more visited parks. Uh, it gets about 500,000 visitors. Uh, I suspect uh, if, there, if there are figures available, the average visit is probably 20 minutes. Um, people stop at the you know, come up on the, on the highway from Cedar, from Penguich, from uh, uh, Parowan, um, hit the visitor center, hit a couple of the overlooks, and then they're heading to the Zion, the Grand Canyon, to Bryce, uh, or where, wherever. Um, you can probably count on one hand the number of people who come in from the bottom and explore the, 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 the canyon itself. Uh, there's really no way to get there uh, within the monument. There are a couple trails to, on the north and the south side, and you can come in from the bottom as well. It's a very long trip to get in from the bottom. And um, there's gosh, like seven gates, I think, to get through. And it takes about an hour, it seems. And you still have to hike about half a mile uh, to, to get in there. But it's really worth a, bit, worth a chance to see it if you ever get an opportunity. You really get an interesting view of, of the, uh, the amphitheater that you don't quite get from uh, being on top. And here's, uh, here's Cedar Breaks down here, um, how it compares to other uh, parks in, in Utah and national monuments. Um, when this map was made, uh, the Bears Ears wasn't created yet, and we're not sure where the boundaries of the Bears Ears are right now, but that would be in this area as well. But you can see um, you know, this, this uh, Colorado Plateau segment of Utah, it's uh, just full of national parks and monuments and probably the densest uh, 
uh, area of, of protected lands like that in the country. Um, Deer Breaks is kind of on the edge. It's not really part of the Colorado Plateau. It's kind of an extension of the, uh, the market gun or the, the Wasatch Plateau. Uh, so it's uh, relatively high. Um, but you can see its proximity to other parks. It's, it's relatively close to Zion. Uh, Bryce Canyon's over here. They're, they're probably the most similar. And Bryce has a lot of that Clarion uh, formation as well. Um, the Native Americans, they refer to uh, th th this area. I'm not going to say this wrong, I'm sure. Uh, you map which, uh, which I think is translated as the, the place where the rocks are sliding down all the time. Uh, or also called the circle of painted cliffs, which are really two outstanding uh, descriptive names for, for the area because they both are, are quite appropriate. Um, this is an area that didn't have a lot of uh, permanent settlement uh, because it is so high. Um, you know, there's snow there right now. They're probably just opening the road about this time of year. Um, uh, it's not a place you want to spend the winter. Up, up top, um, but certainly was an area they would have uh, utilized, uh, you know, in the summertime. Uh, when the when the Mormon pioneers came, uh, they gave the area the name Cedar Breaks. Uh, cedar uh, being sort of the, the term used broadly for uh, what we would call junipers today. Um, the juniper that's at, at Cedar Breaks would be Rocky Mountain juniper, although they may have been naming it really for the Utah junipers around Cedar City. Uh, Cedar City's you know, 20 miles to the, to the west. And then breaks is a term for uh, a, a, an escarpment or a, a sharp um, drop off uh, or kind of badlands. So you think of like the Missouri breaks uh, along the Missouri River. But, you know, it's a pretty descriptive name too. Although, you know, the place where the rocks are sliding down, that's, that's a pretty cool name, I have to admit. And geology is really what drives all this. Um, you know, the Clarion is the, um, the primary formation uh, in the monument. Uh, it's about 1,400 feet of uh, sediment. Uh, they, dating to the Paleocene or the Eocene, um, it's thought that the lake was comparable in many respects to modern Lake Erie in size and in depth. Um, it's interesting that it was a fairly deep lake and was filling with sediment, a lot of clay. Uh, and the lake was probably dropping uh, as the sediment was accumulating. So it's it, another analog might be uh, like Lake Tahoe uh, today. Because um, you just don't get 1,400 feet of sediment in in, in a lake. Um, it's usually the lakes aren't going to be that deep, so it, it was sort of like dropping as it was as it was filling in. There's two main layers, uh, appropriately named the red layer, the red member, and then the white member on top. Um, the white member is really a hot spot for a lot of interesting rare plants. Uh, some on the on the red member as well, um, and it's it's a limestone and uh, it's fairly sandy. And it's one of these things when it's wet, it's really slippery. And when it's dry, it's really hard and also kind of slippery because it's so steep and you got rocks in the surface, like walking on ball bearings, but you're on a you know, 45 degree angle. Um, it's, it's not an easy place to get around. Um, uh, Doug and I, you know, we were, we were always trying to find a way down uh, within the monument. We never quite figured out how to get down. I don't think anybody uh, has. Or, or sort of paraphrase the Almond Brothers, you know, there's, there's one way out, um, but uh, maybe not the way you want to go. Um, it is tricky to get around there and, and in some respects kind of dangerous to be on some of those slopes. So uh, you'll notice that we didn't do a lot of mapping uh, on those steep slopes themselves. And here's some of the interesting formations with the, you know, the erosion, you get these crazy hoodoos and you know, it looks kind of like a Dr. Seuss uh, uh, landscape. It's uh, pretty, pretty cool. Um, here's one of the interesting areas that uh, really had a lot of rare plants was uh, Snow Ridge, uh, which is in the northern part of the uh, monument. And it's interesting here where you get the white uh, layer and the red kind of juxtapos juxtaposed. Um, what's odd here is the white layer is supposed to be on top. And, and what apparently happened here is there was a massive landslide, basically. And that white member uh, basically just slid down. And now it's sort of co-equal with the, with the orange layer, the red layer of the, of the Clarion. And this is a really active landscape. Um, you know, the plateau, it's thought to have started uplifting about 10 million years ago, um, been rapidly eroding uh, since then. And um, basically the rim of the, of the amphitheater, it's, it's eroding back uh, anywhere from nine inches to 48 inches every 100 years, which maybe doesn't sound like a lot, but um, you know, that road that goes around the park, that's gonna have to be replaced in 500 years. <laughs> 
a thousand years or so. Um, this is a very active uh, a landscape uh, uh, geologically. On top, there's uh, um, some of the Bryan Head Formation. Bryan, the town of Bryan Head and the ski area is, is close by. And there's uh, um, some volcanic uh, boulders and, and volcanic derived soil. And that's also actually some of that came into the area by a big landslide as well, apparently. Um, so this is a, a tectonically a very active uh, uh, region. And these, uh, this uh, uh, talus area is on the Alpine Pond Trail. Uh, the arrow is pointing to a marmot. I'm not a very good photographer, but there's a marmot there. And uh, there's also pikas that live in this area too, which are, are quite rare actually. And there's a lot of concern about them um, due to, due to uh, climate change, where they're gonna end up. And then down the bottom, um, we have the, the straight cliffs formation makes these white uh, cliffs. Um, this is the oldest rock on the, on the monument uh, of Cretaceous age. Um, not that interesting botanically. Uh, a lot of rare plants might surmise already uh, really are associated with these unusual geologic types. But the, uh, the straight cliffs, at least in the Cedar Breaks area, don't really have anything unusual associated with them. Um, we'll point out this is in the bottom. You might think, oh, it looks like somebody had a bulldozer in there, but this is actually all just work by uh, water, by, the, by uh, um, uh, Ashdown Creek. And when it does flood, it can really flood and, and move these boulders around and rework the, the sediment. Uh, um, wouldn't want to be down the bottom there in a, in a big flash flood uh, situation. And also down the bottom, there's uh, some uh, plane crashes down there. At least five or six uh, have, have been documented. Um, it's, it's sad, of course, you know, and you, you see the temptation, you know, flying out of Cedar City, hey, let's check out, you know, Cedar Breaks. And um, unfortunately, as you, as you fly in, um, if you're flying too low, you know, you've got to gain 2,000 feet. All of a sudden, you've got a few seconds to do it. And if you don't, if it doesn't happen, it, there's no place to land, really, no soft place to land. Um, so it's, uh, unfortunately, there are a few of these wrecks uh, in there. But uh, change to, uh, to a happier uh, topic. Um, uh, even though it's a relatively small uh, uh, park, there's a fair bit of diversity of vegetation uh, types. A um, uh, student uh, named Kathy Jean did her master's, I think, uh, back in the 80s. In the area, and she, she recognized 30 different vegetation types. And there's a, there's real gradation or zonation. Um, there's kind of a different flora on the very top of the of the rim. Uh, of course, the Clairon has its own uh, species, and then down the bottom as well, it's fairly uh, distinct. So on top, you have these uh, nice big open uh, meadow areas, uh, lots of wildflowers. Uh, July is a great time to be there to do uh, flower watching. Uh, there's big fields of uh, lupins and and Helianthella, uh, the uh, Bear River uh, flea banes, real common uh, near the rim, Ridgeron, Ursinus. Uh, there's lots of different pensamens, well, four, well, four different pensamens. Uh, Pensamen Ridbergii is a nice showy one. Uh, and a real cool one is the Markagun pensamen, uh, which is basically restricted to the Markagun plateau, Pensamen leophilus. Uh, fairly big flower, uh, tall. Uh, Easy way to recognize it, actually, it's, it's unusual for a, a, a beard tongue um, in that it doesn't have the beard on the tongue. Um, the, the, the tongue is the sterile stamen. There's, there's four fertile stamens and a fifth uh, staminode, which is, uh, uh, doesn't, produce an, uh, doesn't have an anther, doesn't produce pollen. And most pensamens, that, that beard is real hairy. Uh, but in this species, it's glabrous, doesn't have any hair. So that helps uh, differentiate it from, from other species. Uh, the blue flax are real common on the rim. Uh, it's one of the showier uh, species. A uh, few other composites, uh, uh, aspen daisy, uh, Clement's golden weed. Clement's golden weed is kind of an interesting one. If, if you remember your botany 101, uh, this one's named for um, uh, Frederick Clements, who was a uh, you know, famous ecologist or back in the day. Um, hear about, um, he had a very prolific uh, writers, probably the most famous botanist in America 100 years ago, and, and, but not that well known today, or sort of dismissed for some of his theories haven't held up on the ecological situation, but they had this plant, this cool plant name for him. Uh, the forests on the top are mostly subalpine fir and Engelmann spruce. Um, 
a lot of the Angleman spruce were killed, of course, in the big mountain pine beetle outbreak in the in the 90s, anywhere from 80 to 90 percent. The uh, subalpine firs seem to do better, um, and so you know a lot of these trees are coming down now. Um, many have been removed because they're a, a hazard, and and uh, on the Dixie, a lot of these are being logged, um, but trees are coming back. You know, so it's a the natural process that. Uh, on one hand, you could, you could say you're you're lucky to be able to see this 600-year phenomenon in your lifetime. Um, although it's kind of sad to see the, the dead trees too. But um, the, all these dead trees are really great for woodpeckers too. If you're into birds, like a lot of cool birds up there, you can see three-toed woodpeckers. Uh, they they really like the dead trees. Um, of course, on the understory, you know, lots of lots of wildflowers uh, that you can enjoy. The, the art, art leaf arnica, the Perry's primrose. There's a patch on the on the Alpine Pond Trail. Um, there's probably 50 pictures of this on iNaturalist all taken from the same place. Um, Perry's Primrose is, is interesting. It's you know, got these really vivid purple pink flowers. And uh, personally, I think they smell terrible. Um, some people really like them. It's very, very musky, perfumey smell. Um, it kind of reminds me of my grandma's closet, sort of. I mean, I like my grandma and everything, but it was way, it's like old lady perfume kind of stuff. Uh, some people like it. I not my cup of tea, but um, in, in any event, uh, it's interesting. There's, there's really just the one pond there, uh, Alpine Pond. Um, for, for as much snow as it gets on, on Cedar Mountain, um, a lot of that uh, water isn't uh, staying on site, uh, but there's a, a pond there and then lots of riparian vegetation around there. And um, one of the real common species near the pond is the Bittercress, Cardamony cordifolia, which is uh, a nice edible plant if you like uh, kind of horseradish uh, taste. Um, you taste a little, take a little uh, nip of the of the flowers. They they taste pretty good. Um, I don't recommend eating a ton of it though. And then there are uh, passes of aspen as well, uh, particularly at kind of the north or, or kind of north of the monument itself on the on the Dixie side. Um, and one of the common species. It occurs with the aspen and elsewhere is the Arizona bluebells, um, Mertensia arizonica, which those of you in northern Utah looks a lot like Mertensia ciliata. Um, arizonica is kind of the southern Rocky Mountain equivalent. What's interesting about the name, uh, you would assume Arizona bluebells is common in Arizona when actually it doesn't occur in Arizona at all. Uh, when it was named, it was sort of mistakenly thought to have come from Arizona, but um, it actually either doesn't occur in Arizona or it's exceptionally rare there. So uh, it should have been called uh, Hortensia utahensis, but, but that name stuck. And then down the bottom, um, a different forest really. You don't have the subalpine fir or the, or the Engelmann spruce, but uh, a lot of white fir down the bottom, as well as a few other conifers, Douglas fir and limber pine, uh, some ponderosa pine as well. Um, but really the star of the show is the, the, the Claron, uh, the Badlands uh, outcrops, uh, the rim of the Claron. Um, that's where all the, the really interesting uh, rare plants are. Anyway. Um, and it's an area that's, uh, particularly on the rim at least, uh, has kind of an alpine feel to it. Uh, you know, it's very windy. Uh, these plants are quite low to the ground. Uh, they're often kind of mounded, um, kind of an adaptation to not getting blasted by high winds all the time, um, a little bit warmer, closer to the ground. Uh, so it has that sort of alpine look, even though it's really not high enough to be uh, a true alpine. But the vegetation, you know, it, it tends to be these cushion plants, some bunch grasses, um, a few shrubs in there, but um, uh, fairly, lo fairly low, fairly open, uh, and, and a little bit, uh, certainly a lot more soil exposed than you get on the meadows right, right, right above where it's a little more sheltered. And uh, of course, a real big star along the, along the slopes and the rim are the bristlecone pines. Uh, bristlecone gets, if you can see it, um, has this little bristle on the tip of the uh, each of the scales on the on the female cones. Uh, it's a five needle pine, and the the needles form a little cluster. Looks like a pipe cleaner uh, kind of pretty, pretty distinctive uh, tree species. And um, this is the same species that occurs in the White Mountains in California. The oldest trees, the Methuselah tree, you know, it's like forty five hundred years old or more. Um, the ones that in Utah aren't quite as old, and, and uh, I, I believe the state's oldest bristle cone is at Cedar Breaks, if I recall. Um, although I, 
and some of them will correct me, I'm sure, I think it's around 1500, 1600 years of age, uh, not nearly as old as the ones in the White Mountains. Uh, but they're really spectacular trees. Um, this one is on the Spectra Trail. Uh, the Twisted Forest to the north is just full of these, it's where it gets the name because they're the trees are all twisted and contorted. Um, they're, they're really, really cool looking trees. And you know, they look like they're half dead, but as long as, as there's a little strip of bark, um, as long as it's not completely girdled, uh, these trees will last for years and years and years. Um, and uh, they can still transmit uh, uh, food through the phloem and water through the xylem. Um, interesting is there, there are some really large trees actually along the, uh, the trail. Um, at the uh, Chessman Trail uh, that aren't that old, actually, when they've been cored. Um, basically, these bristle cones, the, generally the older ones tend to be these smaller, uh, kind of gnarly uh, looking ones. And the, the ones that grow tall and fast, uh, they, they don't live as long. I guess that's sort of a metaphor for, for all of us. And uh, not to be left out, uh, there uh, are animals there too. Uh, a lot of birds actually, it's a, it's a good place for birding for mountain kind of uh, birds. Um, when Doug Reynolds and I were doing our study, there was a uh, concurrent study being done by the Park Service to document the fauna of, of all the all parks in, in Utah. And it was interesting because they, um, they didn't find any reptiles or amphibians at Cedar Breaks. And, and uh, yet Doug and I were out, uh, we knew we were in the, in the monument and we looked down and there's this little horny toad. Uh, we were in the, we were inside the boundaries. And uh, so it took a couple of botanists to discover the, uh, the one reptile uh, when the, the herpetologist couldn't find any uh, themselves. So uh, let that be a lesson for whatever that means. But here it is, they're, they're really cute. If you've never seen one, you can see a lot of them in Zion too in the, like the West Rim Trail. Um, yes, little baby ones, about the size of a quarter. Um, they're, they're pretty cute. And that segues into a uh, project I, uh, Doug and I were working on um, for the Park Service to document uh, the flora at Cedar Breaks and, and, and other parks I was working on as well. Um, when, when we started, uh, I started this project around two, 2005. Um, there was, a, there was a, a, a small book on Cedar Breaks, uh, uh, Hale Buchanan wrote, I, it might be out of print now, but um, a little color field guide and there was a species list. And, a small herbarium that was housed at Zion, but uh, there was less than 300 species had been documented in the in the monument. And so um, over the next few years, I worked on uh, cleaning up the herbarium. There were some, you know, misidentifications and old names and uh, also uh, visited BYU and, and some of the other uh, large herbaria in the region where there were many collections. Uh, but then also I got to do some field work to, to really fill in some of the holes in the flora. And, and sure enough, we, we added a uh, number of species. Um, this report came out in 2009. You can get it on the Park Service website. You can download it for free. Uh, there were about 327 species at that time. And then in the years following, we, we kept adding species. And um, Last time, I haven't really worked on the flora for the last five years, but uh, as of 2016, there were 385 species documented in the park. Uh, and since that work started, it's, it's increased the flora by 23%, which is a you know, pretty good, pretty good jump in, in numbers. There's still more stuff though. Um, you know, we're finding more. Um, really, what we find anymore are either rare plants or weeds. Um, you know, the common species. Hopefully, we've documented um, by now. But uh, you know, there's new weeds moving in all the time, and uh, there's things that are uncommon within the park. They may they may not be rare statewide, but um, you know, they're they're easily overlooked. Those tend to be the species that we that we still find. Uh, just to put it in perspective, uh, here's a kind of comparison of numbers for um, 14 uh, parks in in Utah. We don't have any data for the bears ears, uh, but um, kind of in in order of their uh, number of species, and Zion comes out as the most, as uh, maybe not a big surprise, as Zion's so uh, so diverse. You know, really. Uh, there's four different ecoregions coming together and there's a lot of local endemics and it really is the, is the camp, uh, almost 1100 species. Um, Grand Staircase is very close as well, over a thousand. Um, in this case, it's not as diverse as Zion, but it's big, you know, two million acres. So uh, you know, it's covering a lot of real estate and has a lot of species. There, there definitely is a relationship often between the size of the park and how many species it has. I'm not gonna go through all these numbers, but some of the smaller park, uh, you know, Golden Spikes, a very small uh, uh, National Historic Site, you know, only 150 species. 
So theater breaks isn't you know real high on the list at uh, 385. Uh, certainly uh, has fewer species than than some of the other uh, parks. And and so there, it raises an interesting question. You know, we we often think in in terms of conservation. You know, we really want to focus on protecting. Uh, areas that have lots of species, you know, high species richness, um, or what's called alpha diversity. Uh, the more species, the better. And so, you know, a place like Zion is kind of a no-brainer since it has so many uh, species. So when you look at these smaller parks, you might think, well, you know, Cedar Breaks has a third the number of species as Zion, it's got half the number like Bryce Canyon. Um, is it really contributing much to this overall system of protected areas? Um, you know, if 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 we have this network and our intent is to capture you know, representatives of say all the species that are native to the state. Um, you know, do these smaller parks really contribute that much uh, to to that effort? Um, so I'm going to argue that, that in, th in this case that they that they do, and it's important to recognize that um, even though a park like Cedar Breaks is relatively small um, as a small flora, it's important if if, the, if those species are quite different from other areas. Uh, what's often called uh, beta diversity or complementarity. And, and really the focus here is, is um, you know, what are we, what does this offer that other areas don't? And so Cedar Breaks is really, even though it has you know, relatively few species overall, um, the 10% of the flora are endemic species to the market gun plateau, the Cedar Breaks itself in a few cases, or you know, it's kind of the Ponce gun plateau, basically the, the highlands in Southern Utah. And when we compare the species to other parks, uh, there's 63 species that aren't found in any of the other uh, uh, parks. So it's really, it is making a contribution to this overall network. Not as splashy as, as Zion, uh, but it's filling in some holes that, uh, for species that aren't gonna show up in, in Zion or in some of these other areas. And I promise this is the last kind of science-y slide. Um, there's a real basic, sim uh, uh, index if you want to compare how similar or dissimilar you know, uh, two floras are uh, called Jacquard's index. And, and basically you just need three pieces of information. You know, for, for, the, for the two parks that you're comparing, you need the species list. You need to know how many species there are. Uh, and you need to know what they are because you also need to know what species they have in common. So if you know what they have in common and how big or small those two floras are, um, you can apply them to this formula and see how similar they are. And the scale runs from zero to one, zero being if they have no similarity whatsoever, no species in common, and one being if there is an exact match, which you never do. Um, so basically, the, the higher the number, the more similar um, two floras are. The lower the number, which may be kind of counterintuitive, though, it means that, that those floras are quite different and that they actually might be uh, contributing uh, more to an overall system since they are so different. And so, uh, Kind of, I did a study, it actually is in the uh, Sago Lily years ago. You can look it up, 2009, I think. Um, sort of this, uh, kind of comparing you know, each permutation of these different parks. And the two, the two parks that are most similar, actually Cedar Breaks and Bryce Canyon, which isn't a big surprise. They're not that far apart. And they also both have uh, extensive areas of the Claron Formation. So um, you know, they, they do share a, a fair number of species together. Um, one reason that sometimes the, there's high dissimilarity is when the parks are different in size, though. And so Bryce is like has twice as many species as, as Cedar Break. So even though they they share they share 229 species together, um, that's a lot out of the Cedar Breaks flora, but not so much out of the Bryce flora. So that's kind of where the formula um, averages that out. Um, Cedar and Zion are the closest to each other, and often parks that are close to one another share more species. In this case, though, it's not, it's a fairly low uh, similarity, 0.18. And uh, the two parks in, this, in the study that I did that were the most dissimilar actually were Cedar Breaks and, and Golden Spike. They hardly shared anything in common. They only had 29 species in common. Most of those actually were weeds. Um, so very few native species in common. And again, you know, the, the reason that Cedar Breaks is so unique, it, it has uh, this high number of kind of local or regional um, endemic species, uh, 38 in the park. Um, you know, kind of put in perspective, uh, the whole state of Wyoming, where I'm, I'm from, there's like 45, you know, state endemics in the entire state. So, um, you know, Utah is way, has way more local endemics than so many other states anyway. But um, most of these uh, endemic species in, in Cedar Breaks uh, are associated with the Claron formation. 
and uh, at least 18 of those species are ones that are sufficiently rare uh, statewide that they're of, of management concern. And that kind of segues into the, the study that uh, uh, Doug and I did. Here's Doug Reynolds back in uh, oh, circa 2007, probably. Um, we're all younger then, I guess. Uh, although actually I've, I've learned something interesting. It seems like, uh, you know, I, I feel like I haven't aged at all, but like everybody else is. So I, I don't know, some weird uh, phenomenon going on, but um, I, I guess we're all aging. But um, Doug and I worked on this project. It was, it was, a, it was a lot of fun. We, we, we were hired by the park to basically map out the uh, location of these 18 rare uh, and endemic species in Cedar Breaks itself and the Ashdown uh, Gorge area, uh, wilderness. And uh, you know the usual stuff. Figure out where they are, approximately how abundant they were. Um, describe the vegetation. You know other species they were growing with, uh, threats and so forth. There are some challenges though. Even though the park's not very big, um, it's it's difficult to get around on some of these slopes. You know the very steep terrain. Uh, it's kind of dangerous actually. Um, you know falling and and, and you know, twisting an ankle or or landing down the bottom. Um, Getting into the bottom area was uh, a bit of a lo logistic challenge. Uh, but the real issue that we ran into, um, and we figured this out day one, uh, we were going to initially do uh, with the GPS, you know, walk around the perimeter of uh, each uh, plant population that we encountered and map it. Um, what we found is that often at a site, there might be four or five of these rare species growing together. And it became a real uh, problem trying to differentiate between. Uh, the the different polygons, but it really became we we're kind of being destructive. Um, you know, trying to map the same area five times, each one time for each species. We were just trampling this these sites uh, potentially to, uh, to to death. So we we didn't want to do that. Um, but kind of on the fly, we we came up with a, a another idea, which is basically uh, kind of borrow from our ecological colleagues in in Europe, uh, kind of the Braun Blanche school, if you will. Um, and set up these these uh, relevé kind of plots. There, that would be basically we, we take a GP, GPS point at the center and then figure out which species were within say 20 25 meters of that point, uh, and then just uh, sort of identify that they're present and then uh, relative abundance. Um, this way, it was a little quicker to to do. And, and some of the plants, it's actually hard to count what individuals are. I'll show that in some later slides, but. We just would, so at a given point, we'd say, okay, there's these three species are present. We have a little drop down list in our GPS. And here's the, you know, there's either one to 10, 11 to 100, and so forth. And I'll put them in these little bins. Uh, and then uh, after the fact, um, kind of extrapolate from that to uh, figure out the approximate abundance and then create a range map for each um, plant as well. I'm not going to show you all 18 range maps, uh, but here's, here's our sampling sites. Uh, for the area. Um, the colors are just, we did a two-year project and reds went 2008 and yellows 2007. Um, so you see, we'd, we'd covered a lot of area along the, the rim and spent a fair bit of time coming in through the bottom as well, where, where it's a little uh, lacking are uh, the mid slopes. Um, and, you know, nowadays you could fly, a, well, if, I'm not sure the Park Service allows this, but, uh, you know, a drone or something could, uh, you know, uh, take photos at least or, or, or something. Um, these areas were basically inaccessible, uh, so we weren't able to get to them. Although in fairness, a lot of these slopes don't have that many of these species either. They're just too unstable. But we did cover uh, a fair bit of ground and, and uh, it was interesting because I think going in, I, I thought, um, you know, the 18 species we were looking at, you know, 14 or so, 15 um, are these Claron endemics and you'd think that they would be found throughout the area. Uh, but we really saw, um, places where you know certain species were, were very widespread other ones were only showed up in a few places um, may, maybe just up here in the twisted forest or snow uh, ridge or, or other areas um, and so you know it, it, on average um, when we did a sample point we, we might get well anywhere from one to three four five uh, species but we weren't getting like all 15 Claron species at any point uh, ever um, I think the most we ever got was 10 at one site. So it was interesting how the plants were sorting themselves out, a um, little bit beyond the scope of what we were doing to figure out you know, why they were doing that, what they were keying in on, and maybe some of it's just sort of chance or you know, who got there the, the firstest with the mostest, as uh, General Burnside would say. Um, 
but uh, it, it, it's an interesting data set and, and uh, it'd be fun to play with more uh, someday. Um, some of the highlights that we found, we, we discovered at least two new rare species for, uh, for the monument. Um, shown here, there's uh, Welsh's aster, um, the new name Symph Symphiotrichum welshii, uh, named for Stan Welsh, of course, uh, uh, from BYU. Um, originally discovered in Zion, actually in hanging gardens, where it's fairly common in the park. Uh, we only found it in the bottom in the Ashdown Creek and the Rattle Creek areas. Uh, and it wasn't very common. It was, only, it was found in fewer than 5% of our, our sampling location. What's really interesting is this uh, little daisy, Madsen's daisy, uh, Ridgeron Vegas variety Madsen eye. Uh, it's named for Mark Madsen, who's a uh, Forest Service botanist, or I think he's still on the Forest Service. Um, a real talented young guy, uh, one of uh, Wayne Atwood's students. Um, I, I don't know if he actually discovered it, or, or he, he did a lot of work as a, on his master's on the Claron formation um, on the Punsagun Plateau. And that's where it was originally known from. Um, although it shows, it shows up here at Cedar Breaks as well. Very uncommon. It's actually one of the rarest of the rare plants. Uh, only found in uh, uh, like two percent of our sample sites, uh, mostly on the uh, Snow Ridge area. Um, it's a real distinct plant. It's probably its own species, really. If somebody really looked at it, uh, it they'd raise it to a, a full species. Um, looks a bit like Ridgeron compositus, if if you're familiar with that one. But it's a, a real cute one and. Um, Pretty much restricted to the white layer of the of the Claron. Uh, real exciting one was this Jamesia. Um, uh, Kathy Jean had found it in her study in the 80s, although uh, she didn't indicate what variety it was. Uh, Jamesia americana is in the hydrangea family, the uh, shrubby uh, species with the uh, um, oh, kind of circocarpus looking kind of leaves. Uh, we, Doug and I found it in one place the, the first summer we were out there in, in the bottom of the canyon. It was probably just a little waif that had, you know, seed had blown down. Small plant, no flowers, late in the year, kind of been browsed a bit. Uh, definitely was a Jamesia. We knew it was Jamesia americana. Uh, my, my hunch going in was that it would be variety Zionis, which is found in Zion, not too far away, in, in Hanging Gardens. Although I remember the time thinking the, the leaves were quite small, and Zionis tends to have bigger leaves. But uh, fortunately, the next year we went back and finally found it in flower. And it turned out to have these, uh, this is a little bit washed out, but um, they're white to pink flowers. And it, and it turned out to be a variety rosia, which is known from, uh, oh, the uh, spring mountains around uh, Nevada and then in, in um, uh, the Sierra Nevada as well. Uh, this turned out to be a, a state record in Utah. And we, we got it confirmed by uh, Noel Holmgren and, and Stan Welsh. And it wasn't this variety Zionis at, at all. It was really interesting because it, it, it occurred to this one particular band of uh, the Claron that was kind of purple in color and very, very uh, dense, very compacted. Uh, it's probably a different member. It'd be, it'd be great to get a, a geologist in there to see what it, what it is. Because I, I think uh, just uh, the way it, 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 uh, it, it didn't really uh, erode as much as some of the other uh, Claron. So it's probably just a little lens of something unusual that it's, that it's really, uh, tied to. So we we're pretty excited to find that. Um, I just have a, a quick diversion on this one. When we discovered it again and taken some pictures, we, we had climbed down from the rattle trail, which is a, a pretty big drop in elevation. And it was late in the day, we're heading back. And I had a, 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 a hiking stick, a, a pole I borrowed from my wife and um, I had left it behind. Uh, and it was like, we're already on the trail, well on our way out. It's about a hour hike up and still had an hour to drive to get home. And I was, I was pretty beat. I didn't want to go back. I didn't know where I'd left it either. And uh, I had to go face the wrath of my, my dear wife that I'd lost her pole. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, the following year we went back. Um, I did a, a trip down the canyon, I think with the park superintendent, uh, Paul Rowland and some students at the time. And uh, and just said, oh, hey, I'll show you this plant. You know, it's just off the trail. And so we, we walked over there and perched right where I remembered this plant was, was my pole uh, or my wife's hiking pole. So I was able to re recover that. Um, and it hadn't rusted or anything in the, it spent the winter out there, but it hadn't, hadn't moved. I uh, was out of the doghouse for that one. Um, the most common rare plant, which sounds like an oxymoron, is uh, the Cedar Breaks Wild Buckwheat, Ariagonum sensi variety alpestri, which is uh, essentially endemic to Cedar Breaks Amphitheater. 
in the monument and in the uh, surrounding area, the Twisted Forest area. Um, the only places found in the whole world. Uh, our sampling, we, we probably grossly underestimated the, the number, it's well over 100,000. It could be much higher than that. Um, it was found in about 36% of all our samples, which was the highest of, of any species and um, fairly abundant. Uh, it is one of the few species that will also grow on some of the, the steeper slopes, although it is mostly on, on more stable uh, areas. So this one, even though it's got such a small range, it's it's uh, numerically abundant. Um, although it is, uh, you know, it's uh, there are people who like to grow areognums as, as rock garden plants, and, and occasionally you will see where uh, where somebody has dug one of these up. So it's got you know minor threat from over uh, uh, collection, but um, and mostly that hasn't uh, it been a big issue. Um, well, that's not super common, but we did find a few more places. This, this cute little uh, lomatium, uh, the least lomatium, lomatium minimum. Um, what's interesting is we found some new sites for this that were on the uh, the rim above uh, the, the breaks, um, actually near the, the campground, if you're familiar with that area. And we we're it was showing up in places where there was some erosion, and it might have been um, recent erosion kind of from impacts from uh, trampling uh, from, from sheep or from, from people, horses or something, but um, where the, it looks to be kind of fresh erosion. Um, and what's interesting is, is some of the overburden is being removed and then it's getting down to the Clarion layer. So the, the, the sort of the Brian head kind of stuff on top is being eroded away down into the, into the uh, Clarion and then the species is colonized in some of those areas. So it's, uh, it's kind of interesting how uh, these plants can move around. When, when new habitat is exposed. Now the real star at Cedar Breaks is, uh, is this guy, uh, Peterson's Campion, or Silene Petersonii. Um, it's, it's not restricted to Cedar Breaks. Uh, it's also at Bryce and shows up in, in um, some of the, um, the Flagstaff limestone up, up north. Uh, and it's also in Nevada, but uh, got a fairly limited uh, global range. And it's just this beautiful little plant. It's, it's really small. It's you know two three inches tall. Uh, big giant flowers. They're they're uh, you know five uh, petaled. The petals are deeply lobed. Um, this is in the pink family, and of course you know it's pink flowered. But uh, the pink family, the carnation family, Caryophyllaceae. It's really named for how the petals are lobed, like they're pinked, uh, like with pinking shears. Um, but this is a real cute one. Uh, one, one, one of my favorites. It's a real nice place to see this actually is the uh, overlook right by the visitor center. There's some growing uh, there conveniently. Not, not one of the more common ones though in the, in the park. Uh, another one of my favorites is this uh, milk vetch, the Navajo Lake milk vetch, named for Navajo Lake on, on the plateau, uh, Stragulus limnocaris. Um, we found uh, not not a lot of this. Some down the bottom, some scattered on the on the rim. It's one of those species that seemed like it should have been more common, uh, but but really wasn't. It's interesting when it was named uh, at Navajo Lake. It, the Latin name Limnocaris kind of translates limno uh, like uh, a lake, and caris being like uh, like charity has the same uh, root. Uh, it's like the gift of the lake, um, and uh, when it some some early botanists kind of surmised that. Um, Oh, these these inflated pods they're kind of balloon like uh, they maybe floated on the water at Navajo Lake a um, couple of things wrong with that theory Navajo Lake's a dam uh, actually um, and there's a little bit of clair on there <clears throat> where it occurs naturally but and also these pods when they ripen they do split a little bit so they're not water they're not seaworthy um, but they do blow around in the wind and, and I think that's really what the adaptation is um, that, that seed pod is going around and, and going to places um, but I don't think it's floating in the water a couple of rarer plants there. Uh, it's really pretty uh, paintbrush, reveals paintbrush, Athelia parvula, variety Revealii, sometimes made its own species. Really mostly only found at Cedar Breaks and over in Bryce. Um, we didn't find that many locations. And, and we, when we did find it, there usually weren't very many. There would be you know, one here, two over there. You know, there might be you know, 30 plants in a, in a patch. Uh, so numerically, it was quite uncommon. Uh, real pretty plant, they'll make a great garden uh, plant. Um, and then this uh, ground cell, uh, Senecio malmstenii, or now Packera malmstenii, uh, very few locations for that, you know, fewer than 5% of our, our sample sites had this species. 
This one's named for the uh, uh, Podunk Creek over by Bryce. Uh, nobody seems to know who Malmsten was. Uh, I think he was maybe a Forest Service ranger or something who, who found it, um, sent it to whoever named the species and got it named for, for him. But uh, we don't even know what Malmsten's first name was, unless he was just Malmsten. Like, um, we did find some a couple of really interesting kind of hot spots of rare plant diversity, if you will, at, at Cedar Breaks. Uh, the Snow Ridge area I've mentioned a few times, the white uh, Claron, um, lots of rare species there, really a, a dense concentration uh, uh, there. And then the Twisted Forest area, which is uh, on the Dixie National Forest. Um, and here you, you just see these groves of these very short bristle cones. Um, Although they're fairly stout, uh, but they just have all these weird, fantastic shapes. And, and look at this one; it's like it's barely even rooted. You know, it's almost completely exposed, and yet it's still got a little bit of growth, still got a little patch of bark. It's still alive, um, but it's a, it's a pretty cool place to to see uh, a lot of these species. And the nice thing with with the twisted forest, it is wilderness, but there's a road from Bryant Head that goes right to it. There's the parking lot, the the, the boundary. You walk. 20 feet and you're in the into the twisted forest so um, it couldn't be more convenient. Uh, last one I'll mention is the, the Arizona willow. Um, I should have gotten a better photo of this but um, it's sometimes called the manzanita willow because the the, the stems the, the twigs are often bright red like a arctostaphylus. Um, and this one was almost listed uh, under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, Dwayne Atwood has this great story when he was the regional forest uh, botanist um, in Ogden. Um, it was sitting on the on the desk of uh, whoever was going to sign off on this, you know, getting it listed. And uh, they, they kind of pulled it at the last minute. Um, forest Service came up with a, a conservation strategy to sort of work on uh, conserving the species, uh, kind of doing all the things that would happen if it were listed, but without it being listed. Um, and then also a, a number of new locations were discovered as well, many in Utah. It was originally only known from Arizona and the White Mountains. And it's quite rare there actually, uh, but it's now in New Mexico, it's in Colorado as well. And so it's a little more common than we thought, although it does get a lot of impacts to it. And um, um, one thing it does at Cedar Breaks, it does hybridize with another willow um, species, a Salix brachycarpa. But also it, you, and you see the boundary here between the Dixie and the and the Cedar Breaks Monument, um, a lot of sheep grazing on the Dixie, and and these these plants are getting hit hard uh, by by grazing. And here's an exclosure that really uh, shows that. Um, I mean, these plants are pra practically busting out of the exclosure, but they're getting grazed all all around that. So um, you know the, the grazing impact is important for this for the species as well as the hybridization. But um, this is one that wasn't on the Claron formation, but occurred in the wet areas. Um, on the on the summit. As far as impacts, though, um, you know most of these plants that are growing on these slopes way down here, you know they're pretty well protected from anything that we're going to do. Uh, where where there are impacts is on the rim itself uh, and from from people trampling, um, particularly where there's some social trails. Um, this is actually you can see right here the the rock work. Um, this is. Uh, Forget which overlook this is. Maybe it's Chessman. Um, Park Service set up these stone works in the in the 30s as a you know work prog progress administration make work thing. Um, but but they function in kind of keeping people contained. And of course we don't want people falling off the the, the edge. But occasionally somebody's got to walk down there and get the great photo that nobody else gets. Uh, and and it doesn't take that many passes to create a trail. And likewise, uh, this is the uh, Spectra Trail near the visitor center. Um, here's a place where they ought to put one of these uh, stone uh, uh, barriers to kind of constrain people because um, people are going off trail slightly to get a great shot. You know, I've taken a shot there, everybody has, but there's, you know, five rare plants, you know, growing right around here that are getting uh, stepped on inadvertently, um, but still, you know, some, some impact. And another impact is the uh, is a uh, smooth brome uh, moving in uh, quite a bit on the on the on the summit. Um, this is actually the area near the campground and some of the area where it's been eroded a little bit. I mentioned earlier with the lamatium, um, but the the smooth brome's really taken off um, 
in these in these meadows and it can be very aggressive in crowding out wildflowers crowding out other grasses as well um, and it's difficult to eradicate uh, some of our, our park service friends have been working on that um, you know trying to be careful not to kill the desirable um, native plants uh, but sort of attacking the smooth brome with uh, back backpack spraying herbicide wicking uh, the area the, the taller grasses and it's very labor intensive and and smooth brome's rhizomatous so it you know kind of just gets mad and sends up more uh, sprouts but um, it's one of those problems that's kind of under the radar we, we think about you know invasive brome so we have cheatgrass um, red brome you know things like that but uh, uh, smooth brome can in, the, in these mountain areas can really be a, a problem I don't want to leave on a uh, sour note. Uh, just a sort of recap. Um, you know, Cedar Breaks is cool, of course, because because it's you know such an interesting area and has all these great plants. And and uh, if, if you remember nothing else, uh, I just want to beat the point uh, across that um, even though the flora isn't that rich, uh, it has high uh, it ha has high complementarity. A lot of these species at Cedar Breaks aren't found elsewhere or aren't aren't protected elsewhere. And so um, it's really you know it really is a little gem. Um, in the in the parks in in southern Utah, and, and if, if you haven't had a chance to get there, you, you definitely should go see a lot of these. Uh, it's a really cool area, and they do uh, have this event every I think every spring still. Um, I, I know that the one last year was postponed because of COVID issues. And I don't know if they have something going this year yet, but someday they will again. Um, I know Doug and I and others were involved in this for many years. Uh, it's been going on since 2006. Uh, it's really fun event. Uh, lots of people come. It's kind of kid friendly, and they have a poster contest, and um, they have people give guided uh, wildflower walks. Uh, many people from our chapter used to volunteer to do that, so it's uh, it's kind of a cool event. That's uh, you know we don't have that many wildflower themed events, so um, it's kind of fun to have that. So anyway, uh, that's that's what I have. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to entertain those. So thanks.